Thank you very much, Michael, for this uh, flattering introduction. Goodbye, not goodbye, good, good afternoon to everybody. I'm kind of uh, very much impressed that so many people are coming to this talk, which doesn't give any new uh, results or hot topics to discuss. It's rather a looking back on 50 years of research done mostly at AirWag. And I must say, I feel a bit strange to give this talk. I never thought that after 18 years being in retirement, I would return to the seminar series of AIRWAG. So I try to guide you through the last 50 years, which I kind of was part of. Uh, first, I'd like to explain the title of my talk. This goes back to an article which Naomi Lubick has written for ESNT in 2008, in which she connected peaks in peaks in life with peaks in science. As most you all know that the scientists call these strange signals here peaks, and the mountaineers call sometimes the peaks in the mountains also peaks. So I these two are combined and so the title was adapted from this uh, article by Naomi, and then I would like to I would like to say a few words on the professional phases in the scientist's career, and I talk a bit about the unfairness of scientific awards, and I would like to thank my mentors, co-workers, and colleagues. That's the introductory part, and then in the second part, I will give. I will also talk about the key role of progressing made in analytical methods. So this goes back to comments which were made by Werner Stumm many years ago about uh, what scientists do in their career, through which phases they go. And I then later on put it into a nicely readable table. So first you start either as a graduate stu student or a normal student or as a postdoc. In the research work, you are a primary producer and in conferences, you could, can give a poster. Then you move down to being an assistant or junior scientist. You still are hopefully a primary producer. You might give an oral presentation later on as a Syrian senior scientist or group leader you become a secondary producer, consumer, or herbivore, and you can give maybe invited presentations or a member of a scientific committee. Then later on, you might become department head or senior scientist, and uh, then you are a tertiary producer, consumer, and now you are a carnivore. Werner Sturm like to uh, use uh, biological terms. You can give plenary or keynote lectures. So that's the normal life of a scientist who goes through his career. Then you end up in the last line here. You are retired, a retiree or an emeritus. You don't do research anymore. You are maybe a consultant or a historic reviewer. And you give a dinner or lunch talks or award lectures. So that's how the life of a scientist can be structured. But for all of this, you need the help of other people. In the beginning, teachers and advisors in your thesis, and then later on, mentors when you start your career, and then students, co-workers, and colleagues. <clears throat> and the bad thing, or the unfair thing about scientific awards is that only one person is awarded. If you go to the sports area, this would mean that uh, if Manchester City wins the Champions League, only the coach uh, gets the award. So that's why in my talk, I will emphasize uh, my students, former students and co-workers. And to not forget anybody, I copied this here which is out of a brochure, which my colleague, and I think it was mainly Christian Schaffner and Raoul Schaffner who did it. This was done in 2005 when I retired. 
and it shows all the 100, approximately 110 co-workers which were, who were in my group. There were students, uh, about five feder AIRWAG employees, federal employees, and then lots of postdocs and project co-workers. So my first mentor is this person here, Werner Strom. He became the director of AIRWAG in 1971, and he can be characterized by three uh, chapters. He had a, he had a vision. He wanted AIRWAG to become the Harvard of Aquatic Science and Technology. Stumm had been professor at Harvard University for about 15 years before he came back to Switzerland. And then he could hire and employ about a dozen young, young and wild scientists. You probably know, the, the older of you probably know most of them. They were uh, starting at AIRWAG in the early 70s. And the third point I would mention is his generosity. His vision came out when he published his first annual report in 1971, on, which, on the cover of which there were three high resolution gas, capillary gas chromatograms, one from a extract from a raw sewage, one from a treated sewage, and one from a Treat after phosphate removal treated sewage. And they were not even done in the chemistry department, they were done at that time done in the microbiology department. And Strom, being an inorganic surface aquatic chemist, he had the vision that this organic analysis would be something which ha would have a great future. His general, so I started then at AIRWAG with these three people here. Uh, Martin Reinhardt, Christian Schaffner, and Fritz Türcher, they're all here, and they look a bit different now, that's <laughs> everybody. And uh, they worked for me a long time. Martin was a first graduate student in our group, and then Christian Schaffner wor worked for me until I retired, and then he kept on working at the AWAP for a few years. And Fritz Türcher, he moved, he was about six years in our group, and moved then on to another department at AIRWAG. Now the generosity, which I mentioned, for me had the, the effect that I could start at AIRWAG, organize three uh, good co-workers, and then go on a leave of absence for four months to do some mountain climbing. <laughs> that was the generosity of the director at AIRWAG at, in the early 70s, Werner Stumm. And so I could climb this mountain here it's called Lunkoi Kuchek, Kuchek or Kuchek, and it's a 6,400 meter above sea level in the Hindu Kush mountain range in northern Afghanistan. <clears throat> and I, I had luck to go on an expedition with the Academic Alpine Club in 1972, and we could climb this mountain for being the first climbers of it. Now, this was too fast. Back in Switzerland, first work we did was on a contract work for the Canton of Zug. In the Canton of Zug, they were afraid at that time that tourists from Germany or France would drive along to Lake Zug and get their motorboat running for a while in the, in the Lake Zug, and that there would be a risk of petroleum contamination. So the, the Canton of Zug asked Ehrwag to do a contract of drugs work at that time so Martin Reinhardt and I, we studied hydrocarbons in the lake sediments of Lake Zug, and we did our first uh, chromatograms and saw some peaks for analkanes and for branched hydrocarbons, and we could discuss that some of these hydrocarbons uh, were from petroleum origin, but we also saw that uh, quite a lot of these hydrocarbons were of biogenic origin. My next mentor was Max Bloomer at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So again, the generosity of Werner Stumm sent me for a year to work as a postdoc in Woods Hole. And Max Bloomer was an emigrated Swiss chemic chemist who worked for a while, for many years, for the oil chemistry, oil, oil industry. And then he went to Woods Hole and started to study 
hydrocarbons in the environment in connection with a, a oil spill they had nearby, and but also on much a broader approach. So there we, I learned to analyze polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons without capillary gas chromatography. We do, did, did chromatography by hand and then analyzed the, oh, and then analyzed the, the fractions by mass spectrometry. In that way, we could see that not only the parent compounds were present, but also alkylated homologous series in each uh, ring category of the PAHs. There was a side product we had uh, seen in sediments from New Bedford Harbor that there were PCBs present, and this was in 72. And that case was one of the larger PCB contaminations later on in the United States. Let's just briefly discuss a bit the universe of chemicals with which we have to work and we like to use this polarity volatility diagrams in which you see on the left corner, on the left corner you see the volatiles and then if you go towards the upper right corner, you get into the polar hydrophilic chemicals. So we started out with the volatiles, and for that purpose, we could use gas chromatography, as you can see on the same graph here on the right corner. And later on, we then moved up towards the polar the hydrophilic compounds, and then we had to use liquid chromatography. So, so on this uh, timeline, you see how this developed in the 1970s. There was GC with ECD, that's the start of environmental chemistry, kind of. And then it moved on to GCMS <clears throat> and GCMSMS and LCMS and up to high resolution uh, mass chromatography. <clears throat> in addition to the chromatography, you also need an enrichment procedure, which I will discuss later on. And this is actually my third mentor, Kurt Grob. He was a, <coughs> actually he was a gymnasium teacher, college teacher. Uh, he was my teacher in, at college in Canton Schule Remibuel. But then he, and he was a specialist on high resolution capillary gas chromatography with glass capillaries. And we, Thanks to him, we could use these glass capillaries right from the beginning at the AWOC, and other people were still using packed columns. And on the right side, <clears throat> you see a comparison of a, an analysis of uh, wastewater, you no, know, blood river water in the upper trace. It's done by packed column chromatography, and in the lower, uh, trace, it's done by capillary column, and you see that many of the peaks in the upper part, in the upper chromatogram, are resolved in more, in more than one peak in the lower one. One of our <clears throat> favorite subjects was right from the beginning, the Greifensee, <clears throat> in which we did sediment studies on core samples from the sediments, and that was Stuart Wakem. As a postdoc, he used the glass capillary columns and this uh, detected aliphatic and olefinic hydrocarbons on the left side here, <coughs> and polycyclic aromatic on the right side. And again, we could detect in the aliphatic fraction some biogenic hydrocarbons, even from algal origin, this NC17. And we also saw in the lower parts a unresolved complex mixture, <clears throat> which we couldn't really fully explain, also could not separate the peaks there. In the aromatic fraction, in the lower sections, we found a perylene as the only constituent, and that's uh, thought to be of biogenic, of diagenetic origin. <coughs> so that's our next peak in life. This is uh, the Denali, 
and some of you might remember that it has an or had another name. It was called Mount McKinley, <clears throat> and it's the highest mountain of uh, North America. <clears throat> and uh, I was on a sabbatical leave at Stanford University, and together with this fellow here, we could climb this peak. Martin Reinhardt is also somewhere in the audience. So the, that was a second peak in life. But we had to go back and to work in science. And I already mentioned the enrichment procedure you need. And Kurt Grob also developed an excellent procedure, so-called closed loop gas stripping, which we could use right from the beginning. And Fritz Zürcher was uh, co working with Kurt Grob and published a paper on the stripping of for trace organic substances from water. And the, the method works in a way that a gas is circulated through, through a closed loop and then goes through a little charcoal filter, only about 1.5 milligram. And this filter is then extracted with a very small amount of uh, CAS2. So the actually you enrich the sample from one liter to five microliters. <clears throat> and here we already had a European program going, which supported us financially actually very well. This was called the COST 64B. It was one of the first COST programs. I think this COST program series still exists. Jim Graydon, a guest from, the, from California, he also worked with Kurt Grob then on the very uh, volatile or highly volatile chemicals, which were desorbed from the carbon by thermal desorption. One larger project in that time was the Swiss National Science Foundation National Research Program number two, in which we studied the infiltration of organics from river, river water into the groundwater. And here, the co-workers, the main co-workers were Eva Molnar, René Schwarzenbach, and Eddie Höhn. Eddie Höhn was the hydrogeology consultant for us because we were doing a field study in the lower Glatt Valley, studying an infiltration site near Glattfelden, in which we could see <clears throat> that among these volatile chemicals, some of them, in particular tetrachloroacetylene, you see it on the right side here, is going into the groundwater without reduction, while the others, the dichlorobenzene or dimethylbenzene, they were reduced probably to microbial transformation in the first meters. So the display shows concentration versus distance from the river. Here we had a, a national science program, a national research program number two, which was, was dealing with the problems in the hydrological cycle. We were uh, also studying at the same time, we thought we might have to do some process-oriented studies. Uh, together with the engineers, with Willi Goyer, was the uh, consultant, Christina Mutter Müller. She did uh, work on tr the transfer of volatile substances from water to the atmosphere. And on the other side, we had a bit, we felt a bit sorry for all the other chemicals which we knew were around in these water samples, but we could only detect a small fraction of it. So we developed a procedure which kind of was more encompassing, more dissolved organic matter. And this was done by Jörg Schneider who's also somewhere here, there. <laughs> he looks a bit different too. He actually sent me two photos, one from that time and one now. So I picked the one from the 70s. And Rolf Grohl, who was at that time in the microbiology department, who later on then was the <coughs> CEO head of Bachema uh, in Schlieren. At that time, we also focused for a while on atmospheric chemicals because there was lots of discussion on, on acid rain and on forest damage. So there was also a Swiss uh, national program on atmospheric pollution and ETH. 
had a program called Wasser, Bold and Luft, Wabalu, in which uh, precipitation was <laughs> studied. And Christian Leuenberg and Josef Tremp were, were the cool people, two, two key people in this project. And one part of it was on nitrated phenols. You see them on the left. So the, we found nitrated phenols in these rainwater samples and checked on them through the different seasons and could see that the upper compound, this dinitrophenol, was showing up in summer. So that hinted that this was coming in from agricultural uses, while the other two kind of were at the same levels through the whole year. In the Rigi project, together with people from ETH, meteorology, we were quite ambitious to study processes going on in the, in the clouds and precipitation processes. So there was a sampling station at the bottom of Rigi, of Lake Rigi, of Mount Rigi Mountain on the lake at Greppen, then one in, at Seeboden, that one on top of Rigi, and we sampled at the, at the stations at the, more or less at the same time, and we're hoping to derive some reasonably uh, sure, uh, secure conclusions on the processes going on. But it turned out that many of these processes are much too dynamic for our capacities. So it, it kind of ended up not fully satisfying if you want to study atmospheric processes. <laughs> then in the 1980s, Euripides Stefano was a postdoc with us. And that time we just looked at the phenolic compounds in wastewaters, just generally. And then he found that most, most of the time he saw a kind of strange group of, pe of peaks. Uh, and with GCMS, we then could de de detect or determine that these were non phenol on the left side there, and then non phenol 1-ethoxylate and non phenol 2-ethoxylate. And we could derive that these chemicals were metabolites from non-ionic surfactants of the non phenol type, which were used very popular in uh, detergents in laundry and other de and cleaning agents. The discussion on it was based on, on a toxicity table or data on the toxicity of these chemicals which were studied by the chemical industry, the detergent industry, and they compared the toxic lab, toxic effects of non ethanol polyethoxylates, so with 30 ethoxy groups, and then lowering to 20, 10, or 5 to 4. And if you look at this data, you see that the shorter the ethoxy chain is, the more toxic is the chemical. So that drew quite a bit of attention among the detergent producers because they were not aware, aware that some of their chemicals were transformed into more toxic chemicals during wastewater, wastewater treatment. Then we, we also studied sewage sludge, so we started to analyze sewage sludge and we again found this non phenol and in quite high concentrations. And we managed to write the, or submit and publish a paper in Science in 84. And in that, you see the peaks up there. On the left trace is a gas chromatogram. And on the right side is an NMR. And that was the only, only time we could use NMR in uh, environmental, in our work, because for NMR you need higher concentrations and not, you cannot deal with so complex mixtures. <clears throat> so the team was uh, at the, the party on the left there. There's Maria Nahel, we meet him in a short time, then Christian Schaffner, who was known for, uh, 
for smoking the pipe at that time, and Paul Brunner at that time also at the AWOC, but he then later on went to the Technical University in Vienna. So in we saw also saw that in the anaerobic stabilization we had high levels of this nonphenol in the digestive sludges and much less in the aerobic stabilization. So that meant that in the in the treatment, in the anaerobic treatment, we kind of got stuck. Uh, so our paper in science was not really very successful for about 10 years. So if this, these are the citations in Web of Science. And <clears throat> on the left, it starts at 1984. And that it fluctuates between 14 and 4 until about 95. And then all of a sudden, it increases towards much higher levels and then stays in the range of 30 to 34, almost 40 citations per year. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that paper here, which was published in 93, in which John Sumter and Susan Jobling showed that these non ethanol compounds had an estrogenic effect on fish. So after that, many more people started to study these non ethanolic compounds, and also the, the topic of endogenic compounds in the environment got kind of a, a fashionable topic and was studied, studied by many people. So our manuscript, the publications show that it was kind of a, a sleeping beauty in German. So for a while, it was uh, not, not much activity, and all of a sudden, it, it woke up. Then we had a graduate student, kind of a exchange graduate student in a way, Marian Ahel. He was a graduate student officially at the University of Zagreb, but he stayed with us <coughs> for a year first, and then he came back several times. And he was a very hard working graduate student. And he first did the analytical method development for these chemicals. And then he studied them in, in wastewater treatment and in the sludges and so on. So he all together, he between 1985 and 2000, he published 17 scientific articles. And there were they are cited about 2,600 times. So in my view, a very extraordinary dissertation. One paper, well, this one shown here, that's uh, the fate in treatment, in uh, wastewater treatment, was in, done in cooperation with the control laboratory, the Gewässerschutzlabor of the canton of Zurich. So that's what we also try to cooperate with people working in the application field. <clears throat> we constructed these uh, mass flow di diagrams. Up here is the one for overall for non-infinol ethoxylate. So if you take in 100% to the primary clarifier, and then to the activated treatment and to the secondary clarifier, you see that about 40% of the material still comes out, and about 20% goes into the anaerobic digester and ends up in the <coughs> sewage sludge, in the digested sewage sludge, which you can see better in the middle diagram, which are the mass flows for non ethanol. Only a smaller amount comes in and 640% goes down through the digestive sludge. This was done also in a national research program on the raw and other materials, the program sewage sludge. On the right side is again, the, I think the concentrations as they vary between 83 and 86 but are even increasing. We were following up this fate of the behavior of these non-infinols in much detail. Hans Bicoller also was along 
for this work and Frederick Gabriel and Felix Wegstein, he did a thesis focusing on the acid in the middle of this transformation scheme. You have a carboxylate which can be which shows up in quite substantial concentrations and Felix studied them in the activated sludge treatment as you see on the right side and also in a sand filter and there was quite a bit of this material finally eliminated in the in the sand filter our other kind of field area was the Glot River flowing out of the Greifensee and having about the input of about four, about six treatment plants. And we did several studies on this river. I cannot uh, discuss all of them. We had one on NTA and EETA. And Niels Jonkers, a postdoc who stayed on then at AMAG afterwards, he looked again at the non ethanol compounds, but he also included bisphenol A and parabenes along this river. The analysis of non ethanol turned out to be quite complex because non ethanol itself is a mixture, a complicated mixture of various alkyl isomers. And we, in the end, we could analyze it by two-dimensional gas chromatography with a time of flight mass spectrometer as a detector. And this was done with Bob Egan House from the US Geological Survey. Altogether, we focused on many different chemicals in the detergent package and several people were involved. So we looked at some of the, of the surfactants we also looked at the linear alkyl benzyl sulfonates, the anionic surfactants, at uh, DITMAC, which is a cationic surfactant, and on fluorescent whitening agents. I've listed some people who, or show, show some people who were involved, but also can give you some more information, for instance, on the LAS. LAS is, a, is the most important surfactant in household detergent, still is, and that's thought to be biodegradable. But the mass flow diagram, again in a treatment plant, shows that if you come in with 100% LAS, you end up with 22% on the digested sludge. And the reason is that this compound is aerobically degraded, but not anaerobically. So in the sludge digestion, it gets enriched. We repeated this work, as we already mentioned, by Lena Schinkel in the, as a postdoc in the last four years. And the, it was funded by, the, by Buval, and uh, it shows that the LAS are still there. There is no going back of, of the LAS. It still stays at this level of 3.7 grams per kilogram. The other chemicals are partly quite reduced, in particular nonilphenol, which in the meantime was banned from its use in household detergents. We did some sediment studies again on optical brighteners, fluorescent whitening agents, and on LAS and branched LAS, branched ABS or TPS. And there you could see that in the sediment record, if you go down in the core, you see that these chemicals were at higher concentrations in earlier years. Similarly, in for the Similarly, a similar conclusion you can draw for the fluorescing whitening agents. And this was done by Thomas Poiter, Jean-Marc Stoll, and Ronnie Reiser, who also somewhere here. Now, let me move on here. There was one case in Switzerland, which was uh, very dramatic in 1986. This uh, Schweizer Halle fire, at Salto, which created uh, 
by a firefighter's water and input, a drastic input into the river Rhine, which then showed this effect here. And quite many people of Eavalt were working on this problem, including us, and we could then analyze, determine these pesticides which were discharged from this fire, mm -hmm. and we could follow them up on the Rhine River, as it was shown in the site in a cartoon here. And we could also measure the Sado wave at Bad Honef, that's a measuring station in at the German Dutch border. And there we could compare the chemical measurements, these thiophosphoric acids, which were the main damaging constituents or contaminants, and the effect on Daphnia and on esterase activity. So that's one of the few cases where chemical measurements and biological effect studies have been successfully simultaneously done. Now go, let's go to another peak here. That was a, a trip with the group, actually. It's a kleine Winkelle, Free Winkelle, and it was a trip. Some of us climbed this peak here, other, and others made it to the hut, and this shows a picture of the group there. And this includes now also here on, on the right side, Erika, who was uh, very instrumental for me through all these years. You know, we were still organized old fashioned way. The man working out somewhere and uh, the woman at home running the family and running the household. So she was a very great help to for doing all of this. And she also came along when we had some social or climbing activities. Now back to the work, there were still lots of chemicals waiting for us and we organized them in, a, in this diagram, in this uh, volatility, lipopolarity diagram. I don't want to go into detail here. Uh, several of them we were uh, studying, others we didn't. And I just noticed that uh, a similar diagram is still used and that's now the bridge to the to the current the actual situation. This diagram of the light, right corner is from Heinz Singer. He gave a talk that's an analytical chemist in the chemistry department at Eavog. He used the term universe, universe of chemicals and they used the same volatility polarity scheme in a talk he gave at Euro Analysis a few months ago. <clears throat> we also switched now from you know, we started at the left corner. The, now it comes again. Yeah. We started, <laughs> but it's very nervous. <laughs> we started down here and moved up towards this corner. And now we use liquid chromatography and we focus quite a bit on the antibiotics, which we could analyze in wastewaters and rivers and groundwaters. Oh no, I was too too fast in, the, <laughs> in between we had three people working on sulfonates aromatic sulfonates we knew from the LAS and from other detergent compounds that the sulfonate group brings in a lot of of solubility a lot of hydrophility so we focused for a while on these naphthalene sulfonates on uh, and Benzene sulfonates in at various places, starting from uh, leachates and plumes of landfills, going to uh, groundwater affected by tunnel construction. These are other three graduate students who worked with that. The I think the two, the middle one is here. She works uh, at Bachema and Beat Altenbach. He has switched. He has switched fields after his thesis. He became a Jesuit after uh, his study here. And so the Ariadiker, she worked for Nestle for many years. <clears throat> so now I have to watch a bit. Now, now we switch to the antibiotics. And the first study, which was a thesis by Eva Golet under the direction of Alfredo Alder, focused on the cyprofloxacines 
which she could show that they were uh, <coughs> the, on a study in the river Glatt, that some of them were eliminated on the course of the river, about 66% here. And, uh, but she also could show that in the sludge, there are still levels there, and she did a study on sludge on soil. The other compound class which we studied were the sulfonamides, macrolides, and timotoprin. Here we cooperated strongly with the engineers, with Hans Rudi Sigrich and Adrian Jos, and it was a, a thesis work by Anke Goebel. Uh, again, <coughs> there was a behavior in treatment plant was also related to the solid retention times. So it could be shown that the longer the water is treated in the wastewater, in the biological treatment, the better these compounds are removed. <clears throat> then we had a Greek, uh, again a Greek guest, Dimitra Vutsa. We were now focusing on more polar compounds, including these benzotriazoles, which she found in the Glut River at increasing levels along the, the flow of the river. And in a second study, a bit later on, we focused on the flugplatz on the airport here in Cloton, and we could show on the right side, you see the kilograms per week, which were running through the river. In the first, uh, the upper station one here, and then in a station after the airport and from the usage figures which we got from the airport, Zurich airport, we could see that the use of these chemicals in de-icing season is reflected then later on by the levels found in the rivers, in the Glot River. Then comes the time when we started to work globally well, not really globally, but in Asia, which was already mentioned by Michael Burke, we had this cooperation between Switzerland and uh, Vietnam, this uh, program on environmental science in northern Vietnam, ESTNV. And we actually started there with looking at various chemicals, including volatile compounds, ammonia, etc., all kinds of phosphorus, pesticides, chlorinated phenols, etc. But the focus then turned on to arsenic, which was found to be elevated in the Hanoi area, particularly a little bit south. So the red spots here, the red points are levels above 300. <clears throat> and that was a bit the start of arsenic work, or maybe not the first start, but it was kind of one motivation for quite many projects here at ALARC, this uh, results of this cooperation with a Vietnamese group. One other chemical which came into focus later on were the fluorinated chemicals, PFAS, that was done in 2008, or two, published in 2008, and the key persons were Aurea Kiaia and Jennifer Field. It's Jennifer, both of them at that time at Oregon State University, and Christoph Ort here at Erwag, and Hans Piccolo was also along. <clears throat> and these chemicals are discharged to the Glot River and don't show any reduction in the flow of the river. So the mass flows, in contrast to what we have just seen, the mass flows are not going down. If you calculate the blue ones, are the measured flow rates of flows, the measured flows in the river, and the yellow one, the yellow bars, are the calculated the calculated values based on the inputs from the different uh, wastewater treatment plants. This then perfluorinated compass was not the real top top topic here at Airwalk was actually a guest, a Chinese guest who 
together with Alfredo Alder, worked on this PFS in sewage sludge first, and then Alfredo Alder did a, later on a, a second study on PFOS and PFOA. You find them all over in digested sewage sludge. And these chemicals, they are kind of a hot topic and getting hotter and hotter in my opinion. And they are called forever chemicals in kind of slang language. And it's, it's such that even a journal like Le Monde published a forever pollution map in which all the spots here are measured stations. And you could also look up, we looked up at the glut and in this paper, which was published in last year, I think, it also was the GLUT study, which was done in 2006. <clears throat> Currently, PFOS are analyzed in large numbers. And here I have some figures from Bachema. The method at Bachema was introduced in 2007, I think, by Jennifer mainly. And um, then they didn't have much to do for about 10 years or even longer, and then all of a sudden, they get the increased amounts of, of numbers, of anal analysis they have to do in waste uh, disposal sites and in contaminated sites. So this is a problem, I think, which will be around for quite some time. All right, so now I switch to, just briefly before I finish my presentation, to what is going on right now. Right now, people here at, at Airwalk have started to get out of just this target analysis, not just measure a compound for which you have a, a reference standard which you're looking for. They now do so-called so mass suspect screening and non-target screening. And for that, you need a high-resolution mass spectrometer and you need a very good... Uh, <coughs> data treatment because you get a lot of data and you have to work that out afterwards. And I should just show you two slides from uh, current AIRWAC organic analyst. One is from Heinz Singer, and he shows that on the left side, there is a high re resolution with a triple quad. That's an instrument with, with two quadrupoles. And on mm -hmm. the right side is Orbitrap, high resolution mass spectrometry. And on the left side, you see that you still do target analysis, toxic non-polar insecticide, persistent polar pesticides. And on the right side, you still have targets, illicit drugs. And that they do on a portable MS system. But then you have the suspects and the non-targets, the cyanotoxin, the industrial chemicals, which they do by so-called non-target screening. And the next slide is by Julie, from Juliane Hollander. She also gave a talk on the same topic, but organized it a bit different. She says what we need is needed as instrumentation, high mass accuracy and resolution, high sensitivity, chromatographic solution, and soft ionization. And then on the right side, you see there's a lot of emphasis on the data analysis with databases. And what is actually the goal is a comprehensive and sensitive multi-target screening and suspect screening and identification of non-target compounds. So that's the current state. I thought I will not finish without letting you know that this discipline of analysis of organic chemicals is going on and is still a current topic at AIRWAG. And now that's my last peaks here. I hope you recognize these peaks. If, um, if not, <laughs> this is the Eigenmöchen Jungfrau. And I show it um, because I'm kind of a bit proud of it that in 94, a group of our group, of our um, group at Airwalk, climbed the summit of, of Mönch. So left is Tom Field, Hans Bicoller, 
that's me and Jennifer Field. So that was kind of the last peak I show you uh, from the life side and not just from the science side. I thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed some of my pictures and some of my talk. Thank you.